Most of you know Ted. You know his time at the White Museum. Uh, you know his time in politics. You know his books. All those years, 50 years in Banff. And nobody in the Bow Valley community has contributed more to our community than Ted. So thank you, Ted. Thank you for coming to Banff and sharing thank, your stories. Thank you for your... Thank you for your kind words, Chick, and it's just a delight to be here. I don't get to Banff very often, but it's coming home when I do. It's uh, where I live, still live spiritually. I live in Okotoks now, and I look west. Uh, as I said to Chick earlier, I lived in the Rockies for 50 years and didn't realize there was such a thing as sunsets until I got to Okotoks. So <laughs> life goes on, and you keep uh, learning. And thank you for... Uh, asking me to be part of this pantheon of, of interviews you've done. That's, it's an incredible. Uh, I, I'm happy to say I know and worked with every single one of the 20 that you, yeah. you mentioned. So that makes me feel really good. Great. Well, well welcome, Ted. Um, so you're a historian, great historian. Um, you graduated in 1971 with a master's degree in history from Edmonton. Where did this love of history come from? Um, I, I was a member of a third-generation family of Edmontonians. My grandfather started one of the first uh, uh, gentlemen's furnishings uh, businesses in Edmonton, Jasper Avenue, 99th Street, uh, right across from the McDonald Hotel. So as a young lad, I, uh, my father managed the business, and on Saturdays, when his uh, accountant wasn't there, he would take me to his store, and upstairs in the store, beautiful store, was an Underwood typewriter that I could use on Saturdays when the accountant wasn't there. So I started by copying... Uh, stories from Field and Stream and Outdoor Life that my dad had a collection of, got a feel for writing, and even as a, a, a young teenager, uh, made some feeble efforts at uh, trying to improve. But when I got to the University of Alberta in 1964, I decided that I, I didn't know what I really wanted to do, but I thought, oh, I'll go into education. That's a, a good field. So this was the first years of the baby boomers arriving at U of A, so there was lots of us. So I went to the, uh, to the education building to sign up, and there was a line around the building. So I said, that's going to take two hours to get through that. So I said, maybe I'll go over to the arts department and see if there's as big a line. <laughs> so I toddled over to the old arts building, and no, there was no line at all. So I said, well, maybe I'll sign up for an arts degree and, and become a teacher later. So I did, and I began to take some European history courses, and I just absolutely loved it. And then I got to my third year, and I thought, maybe I better take a Canadian history course. At the University of Alberta at that time, there was two great Western Canadian historians who both have the same name. It was Louis G. Thomas and Louis H. Thomas, both uh, professors of Western Canadian history. And they just an absolutely enamored me with, uh, with uh, history, and I was, I was hooked at, uh, at that point. So uh, uh, my interest in history came rather late, but it was deep. Good, good. And uh, very quickly after graduating... You ended up here in Banff with Mary Alice Stewart. Can you tell us how you got to Banff? Well, first of all, it wasn't that quickly. It was a year, which was far too long, because I was working selling textiles, <laughs> which wasn't my forte, shall we say. Uh, one day I got a, uh, a call from my thesis supervisor, who was Louis G. Thomas, uh, who said, uh, I know a lady in Banff, uh, and uh, they're looking for an archivist, and I thought of you. Would you like to go and meet her and uh, see if she'd be interested you in you and you in her? And I was totally flabbergasted because even though I'd done quite a bit of research in archives on my thesis, 
I, I wasn't a, a trained art dresser. As a matter of fact, there wasn't probably 10 of them in all of Canada at that time. And so I said, sure, of course. So one March day in 1972, I trundled off from Edmonton, came driving into Banff. It was one of those perfect March days. And I uh, got a speeding ticket coming down Banff Avenue. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was anxious to get here. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, uh, came into the building, and I was introduced to a totally striking and interesting woman. It was Mary Alice Stewart. Uh, those of you who knew Mary Alice know she was always turned out impeccably. Uh, she had blonde hair that she always had pulled back in a big ponytail. She wore moccasins. Uh, she was... I, I was dumbfounded, uh, but we sat down in her office, which was where the archives are now, for an interview, and she put me at ease very quickly. As I was looking out the window behind her, it was one of those days where the melt had just started. If any of you have been at the White Museum, when the melt just starts, it's got a copper roof on it, which absorbed the, the heat, and it's ribbed, and it turned out these beautiful icicles that came two feet wide, came down, and then did a big curl underneath. And I was sitting there looking, and, I, and, and it was happening right before my eyes. And I was trying to answer her questions, but I was just totally mesmerized by these icicles. And I said, oh, this is the place for me. <laughs> this is absolutely <clears throat> wonderful. Went away. I got a phone call a couple of weeks later. She said, yeah, we'd like, like to hire you. And I was, we just had a brand-new baby. I was just totally flabbergasted. I still don't know why she hired me. I think it was because the archives at that time was uh, very much involved in oral history programs through Elizabeth Rummel, which I'll speak about again in a minute. <clears throat> and uh, I had done a lot of oral history uh, interviewing for my uh, thesis. And so I had a, at least a modicum of, uh, of, of training in something that would be useful. And that was it, and 38 years later, I left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Mary Alice, uh, some of you may remember Mary, Mary Alice, but um, tell us about Mary Alice. You told me once in an interview about 10 years ago that Mary Alice uh, made Peter and Catherine's dream a reality. I think that's true, too to some degree. I may have been making too great a point of it, but certainly she was a major catalyst in making it uh, come true, particularly the archives, because the archives was not part of Peter and Catherine's original plan. Their original plan was for an art gallery, uh, some sort of a historical museum, uh, and a home for the Banff Public Library, which they had supported for a for a number of years, and had actually supplied a, a vacant house uh, right where we're sitting right now. It was sitting right here uh, for <coughs> the public library to use, and that's where the, the Banff Public Library was. It was a volunteer library. They provided the, the costs and, uh, and the location. That house was the house that John White grew up in. That house uh, got moved across the street to where Town Hall is when this building was built. And that house eventually ended up on Spray Avenue as the home of the Charltons, and it's still there. It is, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so in those early, those early days, you worked with a number of people that we know the names, like Sue Davies, Karen McCauley, Jan Burks, and you also worked with Lizzie Rummel. There, um, there was a whole bunch of you in, in the archives. There was me and a whole bunch of women in the archives, yes. <laughs> Mary Ellis had a penchant for men, not for women. She had a lot of women working for her, but at the end of the day, uh, I was her fair-haired boy. I, I really was, uh, when I think back on it. I was extremely lucky to be the only male in the, on the... Well, no, Ed Jameson was the... Head of maintenance. He was here too, but literally speaking, um, uh, I, I was in the right place at the uh, the right time. 
I had the good fortune to work with, I, I never worked with Sue Davies, Sue had left uh, already, uh, but I did work with Betty Beatty as well, who uh, was a, a major person. So the four women were running the, uh, the archives. Uh, Elizabeth Rummel was uh, working in the collections, uh, inventorying newspapers and so on. Jan Burks took care of all the mountaineering uh, questions because we had uh, just received the Alpine Club, of uh, Alpine Club of Canada's library at that time, which was one of Mary Ellis's major feathers in, in her cap and put this place on the map by convincing the Alpine Club to move the library from uh, Vancouver to here. And it, uh, it was a huge, huge uh, uh, step in the right direction uh, for us, and still remains that to this day, actually. Uh, and Betty Beatty uh, helped uh, with researchers. I didn't know very much, so they uh, decided, Mary Alice decided I should uh, work with Elizabeth Rommel. Lizzie had, in 1980, taken a course in uh, oral history uh, at 74 years old, I think, uh, from the Alberta Historical Society, and they had embarked on a oral history program. So I was very honest, signed to Lizzie, who I, I, I was just blown away by. I just She was so kind and so helpful, uh, ju just a, a princess of, of a woman. So anyway, I, I knew nothing. I really did. So she said, well, you just accompany me. You don't have to say anything. You just listen to me do these interviews, and you'll, you'll get the drift of it. So she, she said, okay, we're going out to Canmore. And we're going to go visit an old miner by the name of Lawrence Grassy. And I said, oh, okay, fine. I didn't know who Lawrence Grassy was, and I sort of thought, well, why the heck are we going to see an old miner? And anyway, along I went, and we went across the river and up to Lawrence's I mean, it isn't exactly a shack, but it wasn't exactly a house either. <laughs> <laughs> and in we go, and there's this old gentleman with the suspenders and checkered shirt. And uh, she said, this is the famous Lawrence Grassi. And I said, oh, I'm so happy to meet you. And then we sat down, and I listened to her with Lawrence. And they were, I mean, they were soulmates, absolute soulmates. They were just on the same page. And I listened to the interview, and at the end of that, I said, "Holy smokes, this place has something. This place has something special. I'm so lucky to be here." And I accompanied her for a couple of years as I learned the archival trade, taking courses, doing reading, and so on. And was never ever uh, uh, at a lack of wonder at. To, at what she was able to achieve. She, was just, she just had an absolute uh, knack for it. And I was reading through the old uh, Cairns, which I edited for 25 years, uh, in 1976, and there was one that the headline was The Interviewer Interview. And it recounted the time that I interviewed Lizzie Rummel on her wonderful career in the Canadian Rockies at... Uh, Numerous ski lodges, working with wonderful people, being the first person to hire Hans Moser to chop wood, mm -hmm. you know, all of, the, all of those stories, which we know so well. Wow. Wow, what a, what a privilege. And during that time, I think you, you processed, well, you worked on some new donations, some new contributions to the archives. Andy Russell, Bert yeah. Riggle, uh, Jimmy Simpson, and and the composer Maria Daskin. That's that's correct. Uh, I at the time didn't realize how important these people were. Again, I was still learning my way, uh, but these all turned out to be major uh, collections. Some with some long stories that, uh, attached to them, which I won't get into. But uh, it wasn't an easy task sometimes uh, convincing people to. Uh, donate their materials. Archives were new at, at that time. People weren't familiar with what an archives was or what it would do. Uh, you know, they give you an interview, 
but you know they didn't necessarily want to give you their diaries and letters. So you had to be pretty silver tongued to, to, uh, to convince them. Mary Alice was very good at that. She knew everybody. Uh, she had a uh, she was she was she she could be very charming person. And she could be a real bear too, depending on the on the circumstances. But she had a way. I mean, her and Andy Russell are like. Two peas in a pod, like they had been born together. When when he came to to visit, they just talked the way, same way. And and Andy Russell, of course, is one of the major outfitters and conservationists in, in Canada, I would say. And she was right on the same wavelength with him. So she was the one who who got all of these collections. I got to work on them. Yeah, what a privilege! What a privilege! What a privilege! Uh, yeah, yeah, and then. And then you got Mary Alice's job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Do you want to tell that story? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell it briefly. It's a sad story. It is a sad story. Uh, how Mary Alice yeah. lost as, her uh, position. Yeah, uh, as I as I said, Mary Alice had another side to her, and I think it it, it was to her, to her to her detriment when it came to the board of the museum and Catherine, in, in particular, which was very sad because as you probably know. Mary Alice had worked side by side with Catherine after Peter died to build this place. Uh, and it was Mary Alice who convinced, uh, convinced uh, Catherine that uh, they should start an archives even before it was built. It was in the house that was on uh, this location. First in the basement, and then when they moved it across the street, it was up on stilts, so it was up in the attic was where the first archives were. And uh, so she convinced Catherine that when the building got built, and in the meantime, Peter died in 66, so she became uh, Catherine's go-to person, uh, meeting with Philippe de la Salle on the, on the building. She, did, she toured all over uh, eastern Canada and eastern U.S., looking at the few archives and institutions like this that were out there to try to get uh, uh, something that would work here, and this is the result. What you what what you see here. So she was very successful in what she did, and uh, then she was the director after uh, well even before and and uh, after the building was uh, opened in '68, and uh, there was four people on the board: Eldon Walls, uh, Cliff White, uh, Don. Uh, Becker and Sid uh, uh, Balance's son-in-law. Um, any, anyway, uh, yes, that's right. And um, uh, Mary Alice, uh, as at the time I came in '72, was very involved in the national. She was on the National Library Board, which was a big responsibility. She's never been a librarian. She was on Canada's National Library Board. Think of that. And she was on the Permanent Geographic Names Board of Canada with special uh, interest in mountain names. So a lot of the mountain names that were being agreed upon at this time came, came from her. And uh, the board, she wasn't a very good communicator with the board. The board only met four times a year. And... Uh, uh, they didn't know what she was doing. So Eldon Walls, who was, who, who was Catherine's business manager and the foundation's business manager, would say, what's she doing? Where is she going? And so on. I said, I don't know. I don't know a thing. I work for her. I don't work for you <laughs> because I didn't want to get in, in hot water. And, but as it turned out, the thing that really got Catherine's ire was that Catherine and Peter had always thought when they built the museum, they would publish a newsletter. Something pretty simple. It was to be called the Cairn, and she said it would be a beacon to show the way to people of what we're doing in the, in the mountains. And I don't know why, but Mary Alice refused to, to, to do it. And so they fired her. I got a phone call one morning. I said, Come over to Elton Wall's house. We want to talk to you. Uh, you know, I was still pretty green. 
and they said, uh, Mary Alice is gone. We want you to take over as the head archivist. And after I picked myself up off the floor, of course, I said yes. And that's how the, how the story started. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so just four years after coming to Banff, you were the head archivist. I was the head archivist <clears throat> without being really an archivist, to tell no. you the truth yet. No. Uh, I did become one, but no. uh, yeah, I was pretty green, as I say. No. Yeah, and then you worked with Catherine, so you would be yep. reporting directly to Catherine. And no, 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 Catherine wasn't someone you reported directly no. to. Okay. You, know, you you sat down and had a cup of tea with Catherine mm-hmm. on on occasion, but Catherine was on the board. Yeah. So yes, I did report to her as part of the board, but Catherine uh, didn't speak much at board meetings. She let Eldon know what she wanted, and Eldon would uh, say, Catherine was a very quiet person, a gentle person, but a so, so intelligent person. And one of the most interesting, interested people that I ever met, she was interested in so many things. And she was so self-effacing. I mean, you, you, you couldn't believe it. I'll, I'll tell a little story. I, uh, about three years after I got here, uh, the Banff Continuing Education Council was going, and they approached the White to say, could you offer a course at the White Museum? And so the board talked to me and said, uh, could you do a, a course on the history of the Canadian Rockies, <laughs> which I'd started to study about two years previously, and I said, yeah, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so uh, it, it was sanctioned by the, uh, the committee, and I started offering a course called The Anatomy of the Canadian Rockies. Uh, eight sessions, kind of like what you do in a way. Mm-hmm. It was in, in the archives, and there was about 20, 20 people in there. And uh, so they all signed up through continuing education. I didn't know who was coming. So the first, first uh, session, I go to the front. I'm nervous as hell anyway, because I'd never done anything like this. And I look out. Who's sitting in the front row? Catherine White. With her notebook and her pen in her hand, ready to start writing. Because Catherine was the ultimate note taker. She made notes about everything. But she also kept everything, too. Thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so here I'm standing up there thinking, what am I doing here? Here I'm lecturing to one of the people who I'm going to be talking about in my, in my presentation. And she actually looks like she's interested. She never missed any of the eight lectures. And it's just so complimentary. Good. Oh, I didn't know that. That's wonderful about David Thompson and so on. And so that's, that's the way Catherine was. Self-effacing, yeah. down-to-earth, yeah. kind. Um, my best day ever, I can, among my top five anyway, was in 1977 when Catherine called and said, John and I are going out to, out to the centennial celebrations for the signing of Treaty 7. Would you like to come? Oh, would I like to come? And it was a gorgeous September day. Uh, and we went out, drove out Catherine's Mercedes, John drove out. <laughs> Catherine sat and looked at the countryside. I sat in the back seat. And uh, we got to uh, the crossing, and there was thousands of people there. You can, you can imagine. And we, we, she said, let's go up in the hillside and uh, get away from the people. We walked up the hillside and just sat in the short grass prairie and watched this whole thing unfolding below us. Prince Charles riding in on a, on a uh, uh, mounted police horse. The chiefs all turned out and so on. It, it, for me as a historian, to be at that and with her and John was just so wonderful. And, and I've never forgot that day. Afterwards, there was a reception. And Catherine knew every one of the chiefs. I mean, Catherine was so dedicated to the Stonies in particular, but to all all of the uh, 
First Nations tribes. Um, she did things to help the natives 40 years ago that people are only just starting to do now. Uh, many people don't know that she started a school up in Cold Lake for, uh, for native artists. And uh, one of her protégés, Serene Stump, who was a Cree who went to school there, she, she, she would come and visit. She'd, she'd help him. She just did absolutely everything. And then he drowned in California in a surfing accident. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. But Catherine had a, uh, a lot of protégés. Uh, Roy Anderson would be one. Roy taught her to ski again after uh, she went back skiing at Norquay, and she never forgot that. Helped Roy become a helicopter pilot and was his lifelong friend for life. Jim Thorsell, sitting back there, who was a noted conservationist, as was Catherine. Catherine was a very early... A believer in conservation, uh, and stood behind her, uh, her her thoughts. When the National and Provincial Parks Association of Canada was formed in 1963, they had an executive director, but they were not very well funded. And Catherine stepped forward and paid the salary of the executive director for a number of years so that it could keep going. And this is CPAWS now. And CPAWS might not have exist if she hadn't have, uh, uh, hadn't have uh, done that. Uh, Doug Robinson was, was another one who she helped uh, uh, with his chalets and so on. Very, very close one. Uh, Edward Cavell worked with, uh, with uh, Catherine uh, in, her, in her house on, his, uh, on the Harmon Photographic Collections and some of his own projects. Uh, before he came to work for the White Museum. So she, she helped those people and a lot of other people that we will never know. She built the Margaret Raynham Theater in the, in the Banff Center. She built the hockey rink in, the, uh, in Banff's, the original hockey rink in Banff's uh, 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 arena. Never once having her name attached to those things, never wanting to be recognized. In fact, uh, saying, no, I don't want to be recognized. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Wow. She was <clears throat> a remarkable woman. <clears throat> Truly. And you were privileged to work with her closely for a number of years. Um, yeah. And then she died in 1979. And uh, shortly after, you told me that Eldon Walls, who ran the business for Catherine and for the museum, Eldon Walls left. left. Yes. Yeah, he worked for her, so she was gone. Yeah, he was staying while she was still alive. He wanted yeah. to move to the coast for a number of years, but of course he wouldn't leave. He was totally dedicated to her and was a, a very... Catherine was not, never thought about money, really. Money was not important. To her. It's what you could do with it was important, uh, but she needed somebody to, you know, keep track, uh, as it were. I mean, when Catherine died, we found maybe a hundred uh, First Nations items in her house that had been pawned, you know, and <laughs> you had to keep track of that. Ellen Ellen Anderson did a lot of that work as uh, as yeah. well. Uh, I mean, she she. That's just the way she was. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Eldon left. And so, again, I met with the board unexpectedly. And they said, um, well, we're going to get a, a new business manager, but would you take it over as in addition to your work as head archivist uh, till, we, till we can? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I don't know anything about it, but I didn't know anything about being an archivist when I got here either. So I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, yeah, you know, the next day I was managing the Buffalo Block, the White Block, the, the White Properties, and, you know, millions of dollars worth of business, which was important because these businesses have been donated by Catherine and Peter to the foundation to provide the money to operate the foundation as a charitable organization. 
Catherine was deathly against relying on the government for any support of the museum. She came from a background where that was not done in Boston. Uh, her family had supported the museum, and if she had a museum, she was going to support the museum. And that's the way it was. So these, they donated these properties, and they became the basis of uh, what is now still the, the, the funding for the White Museum with a few government grants along the way. <laughs> yeah. So you're managing these properties, but <clears throat> you're also managing the archives, yes. the museum, yes. the art gallery, yes. uh, the heritage properties, and you, you're also raising a family. Um, and we'll get to it later, but you're writing books. You were one busy guy. Uh, I was. The, not the heritage properties uh, started to uh, come to us after Catherine died. We didn't Did have they? them before. Oh, what God. happened is in uh, 1983, there was a master plan. The board did a master plan for the, uh, for the museum because they could see uh, that uh, we didn't have enough space and that interest was growing. Uh, the space we're sitting in here was the Banff Public Library. And Catherine, as I mentioned, had supported the original library, and when this building was built, the library moved in here gratis. So we were, we were paying the salaries of the librarians and providing the space and so on. And the board eventually negotiated with, uh, with the school board to take over responsibility for paying the salaries, and we, we kept the space. But... Uh, it became obvious that the library needed more space and we needed more space for the, uh, for the museum after Catherine passed because we had this great museum collection and nowhere to show it because it had been part of her collection, a lot of it, and we had taken in quite a bit as well. So uh, we did a, 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 a master plan and it said that we needed to expand and that the space would be ideal. So we worked out a, a, uh, an agreement with the, with the uh, school board that we, the White Museum, would provide a piece of land to the school board and they would build a new, uh, a new library. And that's what happened uh, uh, in 1984. Did a fundraising and uh, built the library and added the senior center into it too at the, at the same time. And it's still, a, of course, a great facility, which still sits on White Museum land, but that's fine. That's, yeah. the way, uh, uh, that's the way she would have wanted it, and that's the way the board uh, wanted it. So, uh, And then uh, the master plan suggested that I be made the executive director and that we have four curators, curator of, uh, a curator of art, uh, curator of photography, curator of art, and Ewan, who's around here somewhere, curator of photography at Cavell, who's here, and a head archivist, Don Borden, uh, was, was hired from Vancouver, who, where he has returned after a 20-year uh, hiatus here, <laughs> and John White was the curator of heritage, uh, heritage collections, so he was responsible for the, for the exhibitions in this space, which originally were put in place for the Park Centennial in 1985 and opened on the same day, the day after the Cave and Basin was dedicated and the day after that, Windy Cabin was de uh, uh, dedicated by the Warden Service. So, uh, 85 was a, 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 big, a big deal, uh, but we still needed more space. And so the board embarked on a, uh, a fundraising campaign uh, originally for $3.5 million, uh, scaled back, uh, for uh, the addition, which uh, is over there, and the refurbishment of this area. It was a lot of money for a, a small organization. And, uh, we were always up against the BAMP Center. I mean, the BAMP Center were past masters at raising money. They had a whole department that raised money, and they were really good at it. And so we were kind of the second cousin trying to compete with it. But we had two very good, let's call them luck or good management. Two good things happened. Uh, Charlie Reed died. That wasn't a good thing. But uh, after a five-year 
five years of work um, on my part. I convinced his executors to uh, give us the Charlie Reed collection, which included within it the Mary Schaefer collection, because Charlie lived in Cary a while, which he had inherited from Edme Moore, because Colonel Moore, Phil Moore, had bought the house from Mary Schaefer's estate, and with all the collections intact. And we knew they were there, but Charlie would never show them to us. <laughs> anyway, uh, eventually I convinced the executors that, that they, they should come here, particularly the Mary Schaefer collection. But Charlie had a big collection of Carl Rungus paintings as well, which came eventually, but not right away. Uh, so on one of those other great days, also with John White, we got a call from the executives. They said, you can go over to the house, and it will be open, and you can take whatever you want. <sighs> those were words you loved to hear because you knew it was the mother-in-law. So, so John and I immediately went over and rented the biggest van that was in Banff that we could find. We drove over to Charlie's place, backed it up to the door. The, we knew what was on the main floor, all of her, uh, Mary Schaefer's antiques and a lot of her paintings, but we didn't know what was in the attic. We'd never seen that. We went up there. It was, my God, it was wonderful. Hand-painted glass plate negatives, <laughs> art, uh, beautiful ethnographic collections that she had collected on the Kootenai Plains in 1907. I mean, it was just incredible. So we picked up all of these good things, but there was all of this art from the eastern United States that we didn't know from Adam. So John and I said, well, we should take some of them just for the frames. We can use the frames. They were beautiful frames. So we picked up all maybe 20, 25 pieces of a lot of them were prints and so on. So anyway, they came back here and they were, were, were taken in. But we, we didn't have the ability to work on them right away. They had to take their place in the order. Uh, and one of my employees who was working on registering them, Astrid Bell, thank you, Astrid, uh, came to me one day and said, we, I've been researching some of these paintings that came, and there's one by a guy by the name of Heed. And I said, well, what is it? She said, it's a picture of the Everglades. And I said, oh, well, well what's, what's the point of that? We just take the frame. And she said, no, no. I checked, checked up on him. He was part of the Hudson River School in the United States. I said, holy shit, that was a well-known school. She said, yeah, maybe we should do a little work. So uh, I talked to the board. I said, well, what are we going to do? Well, the only thing we can do is try to find a dealer in the U.S. who will know something uh, about this guy. I said, well, why don't we ask Catherine's dealer in Boston? Yeah, that's a good idea. So we contacted the dealer. The dealer had been Heed's agent. His father had been Heed's agent for 40 years. Now, that's just, that's just an amazing thing. That's like throwing a dart, and, you know, hitting the bullseye. So uh, we negotiated with them and said, would, would you be interested in acquiring? They said, yes, we have lots of clients who would, who would like that painting. So we began a long process, which I think, Ed, remind me, I think you flew down to Boston with the painting next to you on a seat on an airplane, did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, to, to, to get to the, to the gallery. And ultimately, they sold the painting, and it raised about it in U.S. funds. Just at the time we got it, there was a big change in exchange, and the American dollar went up 25%. And so we got, you know, $400,000 for the, for the painting. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the fundraising for the wing. And without it, we never would have been able to, to build it. Still, we had a long way to go, and it took a long time. And the second thing that happened is that I was a... Uh, I'd been appointed by the provincial government to be the first chairman of the Alberta Foundation for the Literary Arts. Mary LeMessure phoned me up one day and said, I've got all this money here that we need to spend on literary arts. I 
Greg Stevens says you're you're a writer and you know something about it. Would you like to be the chairman? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. So she said, well, there's only one caveat. There's $2 million sitting in the bank, and you've got to have it out the door in three months to writers and publishers. Okay, so anyway, I was appointed to a board with Aretha Van Herc, Rudy Weeb, Grant Kennedy, all the you know, big writers, big publishers, and so on. And we, we hired a, a director, and we, we, we did that. I served on that board for three years, and I wasn't reappointed, reappointed but uh, Greg said, well, we'll get you another appointment, because I enjoyed doing the work. We're giving away money, lottery money, to, to, to people for good projects. We'll appoint you to the Recreation, Parks, and Wildlife Foundation. I said, good, I'd, I'd like, I like that. I'm interested in wildlife and parks. So they appointed me to that. And the chairman and I, who was... Uh, uh, from Wetaskiwin, uh, no, not Wetaskiwin, from, anyway, the, somewhere around there, became very good friends. And uh, we'd spend quite a bit of time together, and, and I was moaning and groaning as we were having such a hard time uh, raising money for, to, to complete this fundraising. And he said, uh, you ever heard of Western Diversification? I said, no, what is it? He said, well, it's a, it's a new federal grant program to uh, fund initiatives in Western Canada. I said, oh, well, that might be worthwhile, uh, you know, applying for it. He said, it would be worthwhile. And it just so happens that I was Don Mazankowski's uh, campaign manager in the last election. <laughs> he's my MP and he's the deputy prime minister. He said, I think I'll probably be able to help you. Mm. And he did. And we got another half million dollars, and we were able to build the building, which was opened by George Vox, who was quite elderly, but very happy to be here, and Eleanor Luxton uh, in uh, 1993. Wow. Sorry, long story. No, no, that's <laughs> great. These are absolutely, you have to realize that these are fabulous stories, and we're getting them on tape. This is, we're doing great historical work here tonight. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Ted. Um, and, and so that brings us up to Pedo Place, I guess. Well, Pedo, the, the idea when we were, we knew uh, when we were building the, the new wing that was going to cost substantially more to operate uh, and we would need more staff. We've been going with about 10 staff, 12 staff, and we were going to have to get up to 20 or so to, to operate it properly. And so the board um, uh, needed to find a way to fund that on an annual basis to pay, to pay it. So uh, Peter and Catherine had uh, left, uh, in Catherine's will, she had left two lots right across the street from us here uh, that were that were vacant. And so uh, the board decided, well, what are we going to do? We've got a lot of money invested in Royal Trust that's used to generate a lot of money, but it's not generating so much money anymore. Uh, we had an investment manager by that time. And uh, we've got to decide what we're going to do. And so they decided they were going to build a grocery store. Now, the, the board of the White Museum was a very broad-minded, Banff-oriented, concerned about the welfare of Banff quite apart from the White Museum is the best way to put it. And for a long, long time, we had a tenant, Dick Keller, who had been our tenant in the White Block on Banff Avenue, where Keller's Foods was. Some of you might remember it. Uh, who had wanted to build a new grocery store in, in Banff, and it, he just couldn't find the space to do it. The board, on the other hand, knew that the people of Banff wanted another grocery store because they felt like they were slaves to Safeway, the, the only game in town. So these two things went together. They, we, uh, I was the, <laughs> was the man, project manager to build Pedo Place, and we had to, as part of that, uh, build... Uh, how many apartments is there here yet? Yeah, did you say? 14. 14. Uh, 14 apartments to meet the requirements that were in place for uh, staff housing. 
And we also had to uh, put up the money to build 40 parking stalls in the parkade across the street as well. So it was a big, it was a big chunk of money, but it it did it pay off? Uh, we we uh, got to, uh, a, a really good tenant, somebody we knew well, had worked with for a number of years, and a, a very good lease, long term lease who he ran up for a number of years and flipped it to Jimmy Patterson, who so he did pretty good too. And uh and uh that paid for the uh the increase in the staff and costs of running the museum. So it was able to keep its self supporting status that way. And the town benefited, I think, from uh, having that. Eventually the town bought the <laughs> the housing authority a number of years ago, bought the apartments from the, the white, and I, uh, it was after I had left, but I, I said, well, how much did we get for them? And, and Graham Nunn said, well, it was X, and I said, that's about twice what we paid to build the building. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, we did good on that one. <laughs> and, wow. and we still own, we still owned and still do own the main floor where the grocery store is. Wow. It's, and, and you have to remember that while all of this is going on, Ted is writing a dozen history books, and he's also one of the very main guys incorporating Banff and serving on the council. Unbelievable where he found the time to do all this. So we're going to move on sure. to your books. We've, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you've okay. done... Over a dozen, 15 books, I don't know. 22. We, 22, okay, we lose, we lose track. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, but you told me that your first book, Diamond Hitch, was your favorite. That was 1979, I think. That was 1979. Uh, first of all, to answer your question, how did you do it? When people ask me how you did it, I said proximity. When you live in Banff, you're proximate. You're close to home, you're close to work, you're close to politics, you're close to everything. You could walk, you know, you didn't even need to drive. So yeah. there's no such thing as commuting in Banff. Well, yeah. maybe there is now when I cross the bridge. But uh, the ability to do a lot of things uh, that I was able to do, I could do in Banff. I would not have been able to do in Calgary or Edmonton yeah. or anywhere else. There's just no doubt about it. Yeah. So that... Uh, yeah. Yes, the books. Okay, so uh, I had written a thesis. That was the only thing I'd ever written of any uh, uh, any uh, size. But it so happened at that time when I arrived here and started to get imbued with the uh, history of the area, a lot of the people that Lizzie and I were uh, uh, interviewing and a lot of the collections we were getting came from early outfitters and guides who had been central part of the history uh, of, of, the, uh, of the area. So one day, uh, John White approached me. John uh, worked with, uh, uh, at the Book and Art then, and he and Peter Steiner had started a, a publishing company uh, called Summer Thought. And uh, John, uh, had pub they had just published the trail guide to the Canadian Rockies. Now, talk about getting a winner your first time out. Mm. You know, it's in, still in, I think Brian just did, the, I don't know, sixth, eighth? Tenth, three, ten, maybe ten, tenth, tenth edition. Three, right? Probably so close to a million copies or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was their first. But John was scouting out more, uh, more projects. So he said, you've been doing a lot of work on outfitters and guides. He said, why don't you write a book on outfitters and guides? And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, it took five years to do because that Underwood typewriter was the only typewriter I still had packing the keys at, at home at night or on the weekends or whatever and using correct to tape when I could, but often just taking a whole chapter and throwing it away and starting from square one again. The, the next year after I was published, John approached me again and he said, we have some of Mary Schaefer's writings and uh, Old Indian Trails has been out of 
uh, out of copyright for a long period of time. Maybe the White should, as a museum, should publish that and add some of her uh, journal material. And we got a grant from the Alberta 1975 Centennial uh, Organization uh, given to us by Bob Dowling, who's who owned Terry Owl, which we later bought, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a nice <clears throat> segue there. But uh, John and I worked on that. He did all the editing and footnoting. I did the introductions and the, the historical stuff. And in 1980, the White Museum did its first major publication, which was a hunter piece. And like the trail guide, it's still trucking along. I just saw there was a new edition of it out. And at one time, I know we had sold over 100,000 copies of it. It's a book that most of you would be familiar with. Women just love it. No, no surprise there. But it really sort of touches people because it encapsulated a time and a place and a, uh, a feeling for, for the mountains that is hard to get from... Uh, uh, other than being there yourself sort of thing. So it, it has been very, very popular uh, over the years. After that, I did the Brewster story. Brewster Transport uh, approached me to do their, their corporate history, which I, I did, which allowed me to tell the story of the early Brewster uh, outfitting and guiding and Jim and Bill Brewster, two of the major figures in uh, early, early Banff history and obviously a, an, an important family. And then in, uh, in uh, what year was it? Got it here somewhere. Oh, yeah, uh, 86, uh, sorry, 1983, I, I did a, uh, a, a new book uh, that uh, Stephen Hutchings and Carol Harmon were starting Altitude Publishing, or it started Altitude. And they asked me to do a book on the CPR and tourism, which... It's a book I turned out to be very proud of because nobody in Canada had ever looked at the importance of the CPR as an agent for the promotion of Canada generally and the promotion of tourism specifically. And it was such a rich area because it had all the visual material, uh, all, of the, all of the posters and the, the CPR uh, uh, hired big name paintings, Bell Smith, the Marmaduke Matthews, people like that to come west to paint the mountains. And I got to know the head of the, uh, of the CPR archives who was in Windsor Station and down in his very deep vault, three layers under Windsor Station where all of this stuff yeah. was there. And I, he had never actually showed it to anybody before, but he knew what I was working on. And he, he had written... It was Omer Lavely who wrote Van Horn's Road, which is one of the major books on the railway. And he said, uh, I, I think I'm going to show this to you. And it, this was, again, like a, a treasure chest of stuff. And so this book became a, it won several awards and uh, became, I think, a, uh, a book that set maybe quite a few other people in motion on uh, related topics. So I was, uh, I was uh, very proud of that. After that, I did, back to John White again. John said, we should do a book together. And I said, well, haven't we done a book together? He said, well, not really. He said, how about Carl Rungus? And I said, oh, I'd love to do a book on Carl Rungus. So John and I spent two years uh, working on a, on a book on Carl Rungus. Now, those of you who knew John would probably agree that that probably wasn't a lot of fun, but it was probably very productive. Yeah, both those, both those things are true. John, John was idiosyncratic, to say the least, uh, uh, but man, could he write. And, uh, and boy, was he tough to do research with, because we took some long trips down to Yellowstone and areas like that where Rungus had worked. So I would be, would be two weeks, me and John White together, just the two of us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we survived, you know. 
there was no iPhones or I, you know, no earphones in those days, so we had to we had to work it out. But we did. The, the the strange thing was that at that time, John worked for me. He was the curator of heritage collections. Previous to that, he'd been on the board of the White Museum. He was my boss. So previous to that, he'd been my publisher. So I'd gone through these sort of four four states of being with John Wade. I don't <laughs> think anybody else ever put it no. quite quite a brand no. pattern. Maybe I don't know, yeah. but <laughs> but uh, it, it was. People say, well, what was that like? I said, it was like herding cats. You know? <laughs> but here we produced this thing. I said, well, how, how are we going to write this? You know, you don't write at all like, like I do. Right? No. I mean, I don't write at all like you do uh, because he was far the better writer. And, and so I said, well, why don't we just try something? Why don't we just do alternate chapters? So we did. We did alternate chapters then gave it to the other guy. They rewrote it from their point of view. Then it went back to the original again, to the original writer. They made the changes. They couldn't stand from the changes that you had made in the print. Produced the book, Carl Rungus, Painter of the Western Wilderness, which accompanied a, a major exhibition uh, in uh, 83 at Glembo, because Glembo was the mother load of all uh, Rungus paintings. And they had never done a major exhibition uh, on them. And this, uh, this one was uh, done, and the book was published by Douglas and McIntyre, who were one of the bigger publishers of, of the day. So that was, that was a real feather wow. in the cap. And just to show that I can write with whites, <laughs> later on, Cliffy and I yeah. did a book called The Lens of Time. Yeah. Quite a bit later. Quite a bit of, uh, yeah, like 14 years later. Yeah. Did a book called The Lens of Time, a repeat photography of landscape change in the Canadian Rockies. Ted Hart and Cliff White, published by the University of Calgary, which was a, a book of repeat photography with historical uh, descriptions. Uh, Cliff gathered the repeat photography over a 20-year period, took a lot of the shots himself, and we did a book comparing landscape change in the Canadian Rockies through uh, repeat photography. Now, I worked with John. He was brilliant. I worked with Cliff. He was just as brilliant. Cliff White is solid, man. He, he is so good at what he does. I mean, you look at Cliff's history with the warden service. He did it all in terms of I mean, he was a graduate in, in fire management from Missoula. So when he first joined the warden service, but, but I gotta tell you this, he said he joined the Royal Warden Service and uh, studied fire management because he burnt down a warden cabin when he was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> By accident. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, he he designed the first uh, fire management uh, plan for Banff, maybe even any park mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the park service. He ran the whole wildlife research program. He ran the whole ecological integrity program. This is over a 40-year uh, history. And he ended up by being the prime mover be behind uh, the reintroduce, reintroduction of the bison. And now Cliff's retired, and he has, he has produced a massive database on historical bison use and range all over North America. He knows, you can name a place in North America, and he can tell you when there were bison there, anywhere in North, North America. It's just massive, and it's all computerized, right. and he just keeps going. <clears throat> ah, what a guy. Right. <clears throat> well, there were other books in there on Bill Pito, Jim Simpson, yeah. J.B. Harkin, yeah. um, Histories of Bam Park, Histories of the Town. Like you say, 22 books. Um, and you had good timing. Were you ever aware of 
the timing. Like these stories haven't been hadn't been told before, and you I, got in there. It's a it's a good question because I certainly wasn't at the beginning. I didn't sort of think, oh, I should write this because it's the right time for it. But oftentimes, afterwards, I thought your timing was pretty good on that. And I'll, I'll refer to uh, my first book, Diamond Hitch. When I wrote Diamond Hitch, John was right on. There was there was really nothing on the history other than Esther, Esther Fraser's uh, book. The odd uh, memoir, uh, Ralph Edwards' Trail to the Charm Land, Harriet Hartley Thomas, you know, people, people like Eleanor Luxton's book yeah. on the history of the park. There was a few, but it was, it was a, really an unplowed field that I got into. And I didn't get into it because it was unplowed. I just got into it because I thought it would be fun and a good idea and because John had suggested it. And uh, after I wrote Diamond Hitch and, and looked at it for a while, I said, you, you know, when I was in, uh, in university studying history, they used to talk about survey histories. Survey histories were a big picture type of thing that tried to look up the history of Canada, and, you know, so each chapter was on some sub part of it. Diamond Hitch turned out to be that for outfitters and guides because it provided not only me, but several other people sort of an entree into more detailed stories of these people. I said I wrote one on Jimmy Simpson. I wrote one on Belpedo, but be advised because... <laughs> I'll tell you a bit of a story in a sec. Be advised, that was fiction. But people don't know it was fiction, even though I said right at the beginning it was fiction, but nobody reads the beginning. They don't read the introduction. <laughs> and uh, Corey Brewster came in one day. She was writing, a, uh, writing songs for a, uh, for a new recording, and she wanted to do one on Bill Pito. So she did some work in the, uh, in, in the archives. And she'd been working for a couple of weeks, and she said, Ted, where did I need to get to the source of some of these things that you've written about Bill Pito because I want to make sure they're accurate for, <laughs> for my song. Where did you find this? I said, uh, Corey, uh, here? <laughs> so the idea behind the Bill Pito book, which is by far the bestseller of all my books, it turns out, was... Okay, I know a lot about Bill Pito. There's a lot of good facts out there about him. But it came on the tail of writing Jimmy Simpson, where I had the, the whole collection was here. His family was there. Uh, he had done multitudes of tape recording. Jimmy never met a tape recorder he didn't like. <laughs> and uh, so I had tons of stuff. Bill Pito, I just had an infinitesimal amount of stuff but I regarded them as equals, and I didn't want to miss out Bill Pito's story. So I said, okay, so take the story, and you become Bill Pito, and you go out on the trap line, or you go out on an you know, outfitting uh, expedition, and what would you do? What would you say? And so on. So that's the way I, I, I did right. that one. Uh, so, yes, I did quite a few uh, outfitters and guides, you mentioned the, the books on the, the town of Banff. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, Altitude Publishing uh, went out of business, at least of, not entirely, but out of publishing history books. And I was left with no publisher because Summer Thought had no longer existed. Uh, and uh, so I started my own publishing company. And that was, that was quite a story. I mean, I, I had to write the books. I had to find an editor for them. I had to then uh, get them printed and pay the costs of the printing. Uh, then I had to distribute them. Then I had to collect the money from distributing them to pay for the costs of the, of the books. And one time I had, a, I had a, a place where I eventually lived out on Columbia Lake and in the basement. I kept all of my, all of my books. That it, I, it was called EGH Literary Enterprise. It's a pretty snappy name, I know. Uh, and uh, I, they were all stacked up there. And I said, maybe you should decide, you know, how much money have you got invested in this? So I started counting up. 
came to $25,000 that was sitting there. That, and, and I had to move these things. Otherwise, I wasn't going to get paid. So I started a, a twice yearly. Uh, the Book and Art Den was great, and the local people were great. Harder in Calgary. But Jasper and up the Banff Jasper Highway, I'd make twice annual trips selling my books on the Banff Jasper Highway, visiting all of the booksellers and chatting them up and selling my books and <laughs> trying to collect the money from them <laughs> later. So that worked for 10 years. I bought a truck, I made money, not very much, but it was, uh, it was worthwhile. Fortunately, Summer Thought came back into existence. <laughs> right. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> right, right, right. Good. Well, let's, let's move on. Um, politics. Oh, do yeah, we have we, to? Do, do you want to hear about how Banff got incorporated? Uh, I'll give you a, a, a... How much time have we got? Should well, we? we're going on a bit. How do people feel? You so we'll, do, this? we'll do 10 to 15 minutes if you're up for it. If not, yeah, we will do a little bit it. more. A little okay. bit more. All right. Okay, so how did Banff become a town or okay. a municipality? Uh, that it's a very... Simple and a very complex story at the same time. Lots of ups and downs. But it, at the basis of it's a story of leases and land rents. That's the, if you think leases and you think land rents, that's how Banff got incorporated. At the outset, when Banff was created in uh, 19, 19, 1887, not 1885 when they did the reserve, the reserve was all on the other side of the river. Okay. And then they decided, well, they needed a town to support the, the park that they were going to build there. Uh, and so that was to be across the river. But it wasn't to be part of the park. It was to be an independent uh, commercial <laughs> center to support it, what, much like they have in U.S. parks. And uh, in uh, 1887, when the first Rocky Mountains Parks Act was passed, they decided to expand it from 10 square miles the 280 square miles, and it went all the way out to Lake Minnewanka. So all of a sudden, the town that had started as Banff, uh, which was going to be uh, a commercial town where the lots were going to be sold, became part of the park. So the superintendent, George Stewart, at the time, had, he had sold lots, so he had to go out and try to buy them back. He tried to buy them back, but there was some people who didn't want to sell them back. Uh, so the, the, uh, his boss, the federal government, minister, uh, deputy minister, had to get in, involved. And what he did is say, there will be, uh, all the lots will be leased. We will compensate the people who, who, who bought lots, and we will take them back. And we will lease them to you. The peop, you know, there was a lot of complaints about that, so we came out for a visit. Visited the big meeting, and big meeting at the time would probably be 30 people. There probably wasn't more than 50 here. Uh, and uh, he agreed uh, that they would be 42 year, no, they would be 21 year leases, but they would be perpetually renewable. And there became the kernel of the problem of, of land holding in Banff. Not for the people who had them but for the, for the government, because they were perpetually renewable, meant they could never take them uh, away. And believe me, over the years, they wanted to take them away very, very badly, and they wanted to, people to pay for them more. They were nominal rents at the time. Didn't matter a jot until 1960, you know? 75 years later, it became an issue. It wasn't an issue anywhere in between. Everybody was, everybody was happy. Lots changed hands for next to nothing, if you could even find someone to buy them. Then came the post-war period. Two things happened. Banff wanted to get the Olympics, so they had to do a big, uh, uh, a big push on ski area development, and the Trans-Canada Highway got built. And all of a sudden, in one year, every year, the amount of people would increase by 30 or 40 percent over the previous year. All of a sudden, things started to happen. The economy picked up. Those lots started, even though they were leased lots, started to gain in value. And 
uh, the government became aware of that in the early 60s and said, this isn't right. People are selling these lots now, and they're, they're, they're going up in value every year. So we're going to, number one, take away the perpetually renewable. And number two, we are going to set a lease rate, which is renewable every 10 years, decennial review it was called, and we're going to charge people rents that are 6% to the appraised value of the property per annum. Okay? So they're going from paying $25 to probably paying now three or $400 in 1960 based on that. So that got people upset and obviously got them thinking about, we need to do something about this. We need to govern, you know, govern, govern ourselves. And in 1946, the, the, uh, the Banff School Board, which had always existed, the school board were never run by, run by parks. The Alberta government gave it responsibility for people, things, recreation, social services, seniors, were to be run by the school board. Instead of a municipal council, there was no municipal council. So that got people thinking more about uh, local government as well. 1970 crept around while they thought about this, and Mr. Trudeau's new government decided that, yeah, this was a good idea. They were gonna, there was going to be new, uh, new uh, land rents. The leases were going to be taken away by Mr. Cretchen, who was the uh, minister responsible for parks, and the, the perpetual leases, and they would be substituted with just regular leases uh, like they were giving out to everybody else at that time. They'd stop giving out to perpetually renewable. So the people of the town, uh, some leaders of the town, the major ones uh, being Senator Cameron and uh, um, uh, a, a few others, uh, decided to take that to, the, to court. Took it to court and they won. To their amazement, and so the federal government said, "Well, that was only one judge. We're going to we're we're going to appeal this to the Supreme Court of Canada, that we have the right to do this." So they appealed it. Banff won again, a jubilation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the 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 crown could still do uh, for the non perpetual leases a uh, uh, a decennial review, and. Uh, the Trudeau government said they were going to do that. And then through the, through the 60s to the 70s, yeah, those properties increased in value probably four or five times. You know, they're starting to get up there. So it was a bigger bill now that they were going to have to, uh, to deal with. So luckily, just really luckily, there was an inflation problem just like we have today at the time. And the Trudeau government put all inflationary increases on hold. So they didn't, people dodged the bullet. They didn't have to pay this. And it got put on the back burner throughout the 70s until we got to the 80s again. Okay? Another government, another liberal government, another decennial review, going to be 10% of appraised value. That would be... Kathy, what did you say your bill would be? $92,000. A year. Not once. A, a, a year. Okay. So obviously, this wasn't going to work. And that's a residential problem. Uh, a, a residential lease. Never mind a, uh, a, uh, a commercial lease. So that really got things going. And uh, eventually... Uh, the, the Crown was convinced that there needed to be some more form of self-government. The quid pro quo became the need to reside clause. The need to reside clause, they insisted that the need to reside clause be put in a lease before people were given a, a uh, break on their leases, back down to 250 50 bucks. Uh, that was facing us while we negotiated in corporation. It didn't happen 
because in incorporation, that was all taken care of. The, the, the people working on incorporation came up with a formula that the feds agreed with, that we would pay land rent to the federal government in an amount of which they were profiting from existing land rates and existing costs for garbage and, and things like that. So they had to go, it took them two years to do it. They had to quantify what that figure was, and it was $550,000. So the quid pro quo on that one was, okay, we'll pay you the $550,000. And they said, well, on what basis? They said, well, it'll be on the basis of you lease us all of the streets and uh, utilities in the town, and we'll pay you $550,000. That five fifty dollars will be collected on the mill rate, not from individual people paying individual amounts. And that satisfied things and led to uh, incorporation in 1990. There's the short one. There's, there's, the short there's a there's a there's a hundred ups and downs in between. If you if you want to read an interesting account, which I read just a couple of days ago, it's in the archives, and it's it's the notes for a speech that Ted gave a month after the official incorporation of the town at the Banff Springs Hotel. 11 pages, and it explains the whole right going back to 1921 when the Banff Advisory Council was formed. So, But read one of these books instead. <laughs> okay. 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 Chick, you're a bear for punishment. Good okay. For you. <laughs> okay. So anyways, um, you played a big role in all of this. Uh, I did. I, I yeah. do, do yeah. admit that I did. Yes. Yeah, but you didn't run for mayor in... 1990, uh, well, late 89, when they had the first elections. Uh, yeah, I, by that time, we were getting into the planning for the building of the uh, expansion. I'd been in the advisory council or the school board. I'd served for 10 years, so I had, uh, and, and all of the subcommittees and chaired many of them, and did a lot of the research for, nobody else knew how, involved really knew how to do research for to back up some of the positions we took so I took that on uh, and so I was pretty tired and I was very busy and I was running against Leslie Taylor hey I'm not stupid <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah that's right and Good. she won and did a fantastic job and I'm glad I didn't she, but, uh, but I you, did run for council you did yeah. run for council yeah. yes yeah. I did and I, I was successful running for council. and you ran you served two two terms as I, council? no no I served one term I didn't run in 93 because then we were actually building this place okay and to run for mayor uh it wasn't a full-time job but it was getting up to be a half-time job uh at, at that point and I had a job, you know. Uh, uh, Leslie had been retired from parks, so she didn't have a job. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't feel like I could ask the board to, uh, to, you know, give me some sort of a leave to be able to do that. Uh, but in 95, Leslie didn't run, and we had completed our, uh, our program, and things were calmer and, and easier. And I always felt a you know, a compulsion to run for mayor because I'd done a lot of the work and I thought yeah, I kind of owed it to the to, to the town, and uh, and so I convinced the board to give me a half time leave of absence and, and I ran for mayor and I won. So, oftentimes during those three year periods, I some found myself standing in the middle of Bear Street, saying, "Do I go this way?" Do I go that way? You know, what's the most important thing? <laughs> it's like the guy waiting for two elevators and you miss them both. You know? <laughs> yeah. But but you know, it it was a uh, it was a a very diff and, and you know, I was really unlucky that time with, that I I chose yeah. that time to be mayor because it was absolute hell, absolutely hell. It was me and Sheila Copps going yeah. head to head. Yeah. Bow Valley study, Seapaws uh, yeah. on the rampage, uh, need I add more? Uh, and at the end of the day, well, 
I, I don't think we lost because I think it, it was over the rewrite of the general municipal plan and how much development could occur in Banff. And it became a very hot political potato, not in Banff, nationally. Uh, and I had to try to negotiate with Sheila Cox. Now, you can imagine what that was like. <laughs> it was hard, and, and it was nasty. And there was lots of bad stuff in the press. And Harvey, bless his soul, you know, pressed his advantage with CFOS. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I will say, though, I sat on the Bow Valley study, and that was actually quite, a, quite an enjoyable thing. We found a lot of, a lot of uh, things, that, including uh, a focus on heritage tourism, which we adopted here and, and, and took forward. But when the push came to shove, the numbers were what really counted. And so we went from 850,000 square feet of available commercial space in the town in the first draft to two years later, Sheila Cox mandating that it would be 350,000. So that, yeah, that's that story. And uh, it, uh, it, as I say, it was not pleasant. But, and so I, at that point, I quit politics. I, I, just, I just can't imagine how you found time to do all of this. Um, and I'm really impressed. Um, so summing back up, uh, We'll look back at a few things. 38 years at the White. How do you feel about the legacy of oh. Peter and Catherine? Did, did it work? Did, you know, yeah. uh, walking around today, I, I was here in June, and I, but I was here on a Wednesday. The museum was closed. I don't know why that was, but it was. Uh, and uh, so I didn't even get a chance to come into the museum. So I hadn't, been in, I hadn't really been in the museum or around the grounds for probably a year and a half or something. So when I came today, I spent a bit of time walking around. And I was so delighted with what I saw. I just said, Catherine would be so happy with all of this. Because I've been thinking a lot about Catherine and preparation for this. And, uh, and thinking about what her dream was and what her goal was. And I said, well, this is what her dream and her goal was. It's right here. And it's and it's wonderful, and I and I really enjoyed. I came up from uh, the river. I was walking along the river, so I came through the back of the of the property, and I loved the pathway that's been uh, built through there. That was genius. Why I never thought of that, I don't know. Uh, but the trees have grown up so much that, and and the buildings, most of which I had had a hand in acquiring and helping, you know, preserve and so on. All fit so well into the into the picture that uh, that was presented to me. I said, "That's that's good." And Catherine loved her cabins. I mean, that's where that's where her native friends stayed when they came to visit her. And she said, "Boy, she could have a field day now." <laughs> so yeah. it was all really a good feeling. And I, to be quite honest, I felt the same about the town. I thought the town, when I was here in June. Of course, the, uh, the, the streets were blocked for the pedestrian way, and I remembered, you know, Peter Oberlander's 1961 report. He came up, well, the answer to Ben's problem is to have a mall on Banff Avenue. Well, what do you know? 60 years later, we've got one. <laughs> so I, I liked it, but I know a lot of the people who live here hate it because it makes like difficult getting a, a, around for them. Especially the old timers who I who I talked to, they they, but I liked it, and uh, don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I thought it worked really well. It took a lot of pressure off things. I thought the, given the period that the town's gone through with COVID and and some of the financial difficulties went through, people's buildings look great. They've all been they. To, to a building. I didn't see one that looked derelict or, or that people hadn't had taken a great deal of pride in, in fixing up. And I thought, yeah, this... And I walked over the new bridge, which I hadn't even realized was there until I read the sign. I guess it just opened last month. And I thought back to the day, you know, 1885, when 
George Stewart got here and strung a floating bridge. That was the first bridge across the river, right in that, absolutely dead on in that location. So I thought, eh, that's progress, I guess. In a world that's often filled with negativity, it's nice to hear those positive comments. Thank you, Ted. You're welcome. Um, good. Well, thank you, Ted. Unless you have anything else you'd no, like to thank contribute. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank this you has been fabulous. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you all.